having studied classical music, just the idea of, you know, it's just you and your instrument in a, in a practice room for three hours a day doing something that nobody's going to hear. You're just doing it because you need to get better. And this kind of toiling away in, in darkness and anonymity is something that we don't always think is part of the creative process as a visual designer. But I've always sort of considered that as part of the process as well. What's going on? You're listening to episode 80 of the Perspective Podcast, and I'm your host, Scotty Russell of Perspective Collective. This show is about carving out time to build something for yourself, and I want to share what is and isn't working for me, along with sharing my guest point of view. This platform also allows me to cast the spotlight and celebrate those creating big waves in the community through interviews and a weekly dose of inspiration in the outro, so stay tuned to the end because it might be you. Now let's get nice and settled in, shall we? Nice and cozy. I hope I hope you're feeling comfortable right now. But I want to ask you, how many times have you put yourself in a position to land an opportunity only to be rejected? That shit hurts, doesn't it? It not only leaves a bitter taste in your mouth, but it also makes you reluctant to get back on the saddle and try again. And no, I'm not a country fan, but I've always wanted to say that. You know, that's the curse of being a creative. You're eventually going to face adversity and get knocked on your ass. It's inevitable. It's also the beauty and the gift of being a creative. You're constantly challenged and have the ability to dust yourself off and keep fighting. And I believe this is how breakthroughs manifest. Cue today's guest, Mr. Nick Masani. He's exploded onto the lettering and design scene within the last year or two with his one-of-a-kind, majestic, fosaic masterpieces. However, that's not the only style he excels at, as he's landed juggernaut clients such as Target, PepsiCo, Airbnb, Vanity Fair, etc. with his diverse range of skills. The only thing that matches his incredible work is his inspiring story, as he's dealt with waves of adversity and rejection to get to where he is today. So in today's episode, we dive deep into the topics of finding your own style and voice, marketing yourself and attracting clients, creating a routine that helps you thrive, responding to rejection, and so much more. So buckle up your seatbelts, not too tight though to restrict air circulation. Let's dive deep into Nick's story and his work. You can find the show notes of this episode containing Nick's work and everything we reference today at perspective-collective.com slash 80. If you think someone can find value in this episode, please give it a share on social media. It's because of your word of mouth that the show keeps growing and you know I love you for it. Finally, if you catch some inspiration from the show, create some artwork and tag me at Perspective Podcast on Instagram. I'll give it a share where I post each week's episode artwork and make sure you get some credit. Let's get into the show. What's new with you? Oh, not much. I just I just got back from a from a trip uh, to Kansas City, uh, which was really great, but it was a really intensely planned trip. Uh, I was there for Design Week and uh, or yeah, AJA's Design Week. And um, it was like two two workshops and a talk in two days, and it was it was nuts. So I got back and two workshops I was, and a talk in two days. Yeah, yeah, what? and it was a new yeah, it was a new talk too. So I had to prepare the talk in leading up to that, and um, and also other like various like social things that are not included in that. So um, so yeah, it ended up that I came back and I just got got sick. I was like sick for like three days. I was, I was like out of commission and I'm just kind of like getting, getting over that now. So totally understandable. I've done like a talk and like a workshop back to back days, but doing all of that in a short amount of time. Plus it's a new talk that you have to rehearse leading up to it on top of travel. Like I, yeah, I could only imagine that that's a lot of work. What was your talk on? Yeah, it was on, uh, it was on Instagram and sort of, uh, and how 
how like my thoughts about the platform and how I've kind of been able how I've used it in the past like really year and a half since I've been on it to kind of help with my client work and with transitioning to freelance so um, and I know that's like a hot t- a lot of us are thinking about just social media in general and how how do we do we really need it do we need to like really leverage it or like what and and so since I have like pretty strong feelings about Instagram and social media I wanted to kind of like I wanted to share that a bit. What kind of feelings do you have if I could just get that right now? My feelings are, um, are, are, I think are pretty, um, pretty commonly kind of shared among us who are kind of using it, uh, both as sort of as a creative space, but also as a, as sort of a community and also as a portfolio of sorts where we get work from. So like this, this hybrid space that, that Instagram has kind of filled in a lot of our lives, I think generates a lot of conflicting emotions on, in a lot of us. Like, uh, or, and as far as I'm concerned anyway, um, I'm so, so grateful for it and for what it's done for my career. Uh, and at the same time, I, I can see how easily it can, um, can kind of give me a false metric to, to, that I can, that I could easily apply to, just my own work in general. If if I see if I see this like this uh, this validation or this uh, you know I, I can base the success of, of a specific piece or of a specific post based on this very kind of like arbitrary metric of likes and and follows and engagement that um, kind of establishes this uh, not always super positive uh, uh, kind of motivation sort of feedback and, and, and kind of, uh, environment. So kind of for me, it was all about kind of pulling back for a bit. Uh, in fact, lately in the past couple of months, I haven't been as, as active on the platform as I used to be to kind of assess like, you know, why am I doing what am I, what I'm doing? Uh, what are, what's the, what's the force motivating me to do the specific post if I want to, you know, if, if, more than just or past just, uh, oh, I'm doing it because I want to grow my following. Um, beyond that, like what's kind of the, the reason driving me? Because if it's to get work and the work that results from it is doing work that I'm not super excited about, um, then then that's really sort of defeats the purpose of, of having the space that I can curate however I want. It's a slippery slope. Yeah, it is. It used to be my oxygen, like, and then you have these expectations, like you get to a point where you're not really creating what you vibe to the most. And you're thinking that's what other people want to see for the likes and the shares and the features. And then when you don't and you hear the crickets or it doesn't perform, you know, it's, it's self-defeating, you know, it's self-sabotaging like, damn it. Why, why did I think this was a good idea? And it reflects poorly on you. Sure. it, It doesn't really encourage that level of experimentation and, uh, and kind of risk taking that um, that I think we really is really essential in any sort of artistic growth is just like trying something that might be new for you that might look awkward for a while or might not just might not be or might not even be successful. Like it's it's important to have a, a safe space where those experiments can be kind of can be can be explored and uh, if if that if the negative kind of uh, response or the or the lack of positive response rather comes uh, an obstacle to that, then it's so much easier to just double down and fall back on what what um, what you you think people are expecting from you. That that's true, and I I used to think I had to have this curated feed because this is what people expect, and that's how you win on Instagram. But really, I'm I'm consistently inconsistent i like to experiment with every piece i like that you don't know what i'm gonna do next when i used to think that was like a negative but you know now that's just part of who i am and 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 yours i like that it's not just mosaics you can go all over the place you just did a a, an amazing script piece you know that was just plain lettering so i i I like that i like yours is you, you don't know what to expect from yours either yeah but it wasn't always that way like at the height of my mosaic series um Fosaics were really what I was focusing on and everything else was sort of uh, kind of the the garnish around it or like the sort of the 
the process around it or kind of just resting posts, so to speak, like to uh, between between the bigger Fosaics posts, which um, helped really helped with with my overall growth on on the platform. But um, in the end, that's all people it felt like that's all people wanted to see from me. So um, I do try to, to create different or, or to at least publish different content. That's not exactly that. Um, and growth is much slower, but it's, uh, hopefully you're happier. Yeah. It's just a better, I think it's just overall, um, a more holistic approach and, and just, uh, also for a client, I'm more comfortable knowing that they'll see that I can perform in a variety of styles as opposed to just, Oh, this is a guy that does the mosaics. If we want mosaics, we'll go to him. But if we don't, then, you know, nothing else. Well, for those, let's, let's get into the questions now. Okay. For those of you, for those who don't know, give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself. Sure. Of course. So, um, I was, uh, I was born in Milan in Italy, um, in, yeah. And I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it throws the fact that I don't have an accent throws people off generally. Um, and that's because my mom is American. So she grew up in Massachusetts, uh, studied, um, studied in upstate New York. She studied jewelry design, moved to Italy, uh, to work at a jewelry design firm and, uh, ended up meeting my, my father who was the, the creator of the, of, of that firm, of that line. So, um, he had been, uh, very active in the seventies and eighties and sort of the Italian jewelry, jewelry scene, um, in Milan specifically. And, uh, and then I was, I was born shortly, sort of shortly after. And, um, I studied, uh, well, I went through Italian schooling for my entire, in, in my entire childhood. And I, uh, ended up having to specialize as Italian students do, um, right outside of, right after middle school, uh, we have specialized high schools there. So you can't just go to a generic high school. You go to an art high school or a science high school or whatever the case may be. Wow. Um, yeah. Or a professional school. Um, and so I chose, um, an art high school with a with a, a focus on architecture and industrial design. So I did that for five years, which is how long our, our high schools are uh, over there. And after that, um, I or during that, I, I lived in Japan for a little while, then eventually moved to the States where I ended up going to the same small college in upstate New York my mom went to. Um, I studied classical music there. Um, because that was sort of what I was primarily interested in at the time. Um, upon graduating, I wasn't super excited by my prospects professionally as like a classical musician, uh, in upstate New York. So I ended up taking a five week intro to graphic design class, um, at Skidmore that I got for free because I was an, an RA and, um, and I really loved it. So my, my professor was really, really supportive. And he was like, you know, you could, you could do this professionally if you, if you liked it, if you were into it. And, uh, and so I just basically took the, took like three to six months to build myself a portfolio because I had not, I had nothing at the time, um, and applied to, uh, a handful of, uh, graphic design grad schools, um, primarily in New York city, but not exclusively I ended up getting rejected from all of them, except, uh, except one of them at Pratt where I ended up, where I ended up going. And that was about, I guess that was about seven years ago, which is when I moved downstate here in New York city and, uh, ended up getting an MFA in graphic design, communication design. And that is kind of where my professional life started. I became familiar with uh, Luis Feely's work through um, through liking Jess's work, Jessica Hish's work. She she was, I think, part of the first wave of like young people really using lettering um, and really sort of inspiring at the time when a lot of people weren't doing it. And uh, one of the people who was in my grad program was like, well, if you like Jess, you should check out Luis, who really trained her, was her mentor. I didn't know that. I can see the parallels now. 
Oh, totally. Yeah, Jess, Jess worked for Luis uh, right out of uh, Taylor Tyler School uh, of Art, I think. In I think that's I think it's in Philly, and um, and it was. I mean, she was a few several generations of Luis Philly employees before me, but um, since then, I sort of got really into Luis's work and decided that I would uh, I would do what I could to work for work for her and learn from her so uh applied for a or cold called her basically to to see if i could get a an a summer internship and uh she doesn't take interns so she said no uh there was an opening right after i graduated so the timing was perfect but unfortunately my lettering was just so terrible at the time so she uh very nicely rejected me um, but she did it, you know, I got a personalized email and everything. So it was very, she was very nice about it, but, um, but it was, it wasn't, I was definitely not at the level. So, uh, it was about two years of, of kind of practicing and trying to improve, uh, and that, that I eventually got to, got to work for her. Uh, right before that, I was a, um, book cover designer at Penguin Random House, um, and before that, I was a design intern at MUCA uh, under Matteo Bologna, also also here in New York City. And that takes us up to about six months ago when I uh, when I left Luis's and decided to go full time freelance. So that is pretty much it. How did it? lead up to the full-time freelance because I know you took Lauren Hom's passion to paid and she recently was just on and I've read some of your testimonials and you know you were kind of already really building an audience before that were you doing Fosaics before the passion to paid or is that when you really started putting your focus into them um yeah so I took Lauren's I was still at Luis's when I decided to take Lauren's class um I remember because I was um yeah I was in the middle of doing something there while I was deciding, should I do this? Um, and I had, I, by that point I had already decided to go, to go freelance. Um, we have, we have sort of an extended, um, notice time at Luis's. She needs a decent amount of time to find just the right fit. It's a very small studio. So, um, so I had already, I was in my notice phase and I had, I, uh, I was preparing for going freelance. I had already started, um, I had already decided I wanted to invest time in Instagram. So I was sort of already trying to grow my, my following there and have more of a presence by that point. I had, um, uh, I had done, uh, two, uh, two Fosaics before. And I was still at the time really struggling to think of like, what do I want my passion to paid project to be? You know, I don't know. And, um, in the meantime, I was doing these, but I wasn't really thinking of them as like a, a series or anything. I was just doing doing them. And and Lauren was like, hey, maybe this should be your project um, since people seem to respond well to it. And, um, and, and so that's pretty much it. I applied the lessons I've learned um, in her class, especially, which I think she's like, Oh, like really talented at is just uh, is um, sort of being being a very good promoter of her own work and like marketing her own work. Um, I think is something that she really really excels at, and it's something that I definitely wanted to learn from her by by signing up for this class. So um, I think the series would not have existed. Uh, even even though I was technically doing these uh, before the class started or or before I had decided I wanted to do these as a project, the series definitely wouldn't have existed in the way it did without Lauren's guidance and her sort of her class and the the wisdom that she imparted it as sort of to think about something as a series, but also, to to market the series and sort of build it out into a thing that is not just uh, a series of posts on Instagram, but 
kind of a bigger, heftier project that you can present to to blogs and other kind of outlets to get coverage on, which is something that I didn't know people did. I thought people just sat around and waited for blogs to kind of contact them and sort of grace them with their attention. But really, like she she taught she taught us that like it's okay to ask for coverage, which is such a good um, lesson. So would you go out and do outreach and plug your stuff? Because I've seen your About Me page and it's just littered with featured here, 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 here. So. Yeah, so I th- that is, and that's something that I talked about with with Lauren. Um, a a couple, I think at least once uh, we had brunch together, like in the middle of the class, and um, she, and I was like, when is the right time to like reach out? Like, do I I have to have like I don't know, like five or whatever? So when I when I had enough that I felt like it looked like a series, uh, then. I I reached out to I think three different blogs. One of them was Design Sponge. Uh, I remember because it was like a, a dream of mine to be featured on Design Sponge. And one of their um, one of their rules is that if you if you approach them to to for an idea for a piece, it has to be sort of it can't have been covered anywhere else online before that. So I. I was definitely seeing myself for Design Sponge, so I contacted them first. When uh, when they when they didn't get back to me, I contacted two others. Uh, one of them said that they would. I think both of the others actually said that they would do a short little piece on it, and that was pretty much all I had to do as far as the f- the initial push. Then the the features started kind of rolling in on their own, which was which was pretty amazing. So that was that the thing that sparked it. And then it blew up on Instagram, or was it like Instagram and that at the same time? I think it. I think it was popular on Instagram before the blogs took notice, or before. Uh, I think it was, or rather, I think it was getting to be popular on Instagram um, before the blogs. I, I and I don't honestly think the blogs really had a huge impact on the overall growth on Instagram. It was was awesome uh, to, to get all these features. Um, but I really think aside from one of them, which was uh, surprisingly this sort of larger uh, blog called Design Boom that I had never heard of, um, did a story on on Fosaics and, and cross-posted to their Instagram account, which had close to a million followers. And that that was a like hugely influential kind of like bump as far as uh, as far as the the presence online, and also I got a, a freelance job like immediately after that feature, doing one of the probably my favorite kind of mosaic related freelance gig that I've gotten to this point was a direct result of that one feature. So that was awesome. Well, now that you are doing client work full time, what is your daily routine kind of look like? And then if we could talk a little bit more about. You know, when a new project comes in, what's your process like for onboarding and responding? Do you have a questionnaire, uh, pricing, pitching? How do you do deliverables? Because that seems to be what people want to know the most. So as far as what my day to day looks like, I am uh, I am 100 percent freelance at this at this point. So I work primarily from home. I recently have been trying to work from a a a co-working space, which has been uh, very helpful as far as just uh, increasing my productivity during the day. Does it help with the human interaction as well? Yeah, there really isn't much of that, but I think just uh, removing myself from my living space, uh, from my from my dog, who as much you know, I love him, but he's he's a sort of constant source of distraction, and um, just kind of getting out. And it forces me to like get dressed, for example. Uh, all things that like put me in the right, I think, or a better, at the very least, a better mind mind space to like be doing work and being more productive. So, um, so that is is pretty much my routine as far as as design work. But um, as far as my my process um, for client related interactions, I'm I have an agent, so. Uh, the representation really sort of helps as far as just, uh, you know, um, my rep will take care of uh, everything pretty much from the first uh, first contact from to the, with the client. She'll negotiate prices, uh, licensing, and um, 
eventually I jump on when it's time to talk about creative. So with, uh, with like the sort of art directors or creative directors, uh, at the clients. And, uh, she sort of like kind of observes from that point on the rep, she'll like be CC'd on everything, but, uh, she kind of lets me take, take over. And then she'll, um, she'll kind of jump back in if, uh, if the scope is growing a little bit out of what, um, what they had agreed to, or, um, if the revisions are trying to get a little bit too crazy or out of hand. And finally to kind of like finish off and, and invoice. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a questionnaire. Um, and I don't do any, um, I don't do any sort of like outreach aside from just what I re- regularly do on, on social media. Clearly you don't need to anymore, but how did you land the rep? Did you do outreach for the rep too? Or did they find you or saddle? Is, are you through satellite as well? No, I am through uh, Sunday afternoon. So, uh, they, um, are, yeah, they, two reps contacted me at a, around the same time actually, which, uh, um, I, I took as like a, a sign that like, maybe it's, maybe it's the right time to do this. The universe was talking to you. Yeah. So, uh, and I had, and I was, and I was really fortunate in this, in this respect, cause I know that that's not everybody's experience as far as finding representation. So, um, I was fortunate to have the choice and I was able to evaluate both their contracts and, um, ask one rep to make the changes, make changes to their contract based on what I like from the other reps contract. And, um, eventually, um, my choice was between a, uh, newer agency, um, and, a slightly more established agency with a larger roster. Um, and I ended up going with the smaller, newer agency. I kind of liked their more kind of comprehensive approach as far as uh, they would be willing to represent not only my lettering and my mosaic work, but also um, my book cover work and my sort of the occasional branding job that I have or whatever else they're kind of like willing to take on everything I, I, I approach them with as opposed to having much more kind of strict, uh, you know, we'll take care of mosaics, but you're on your own for the rest, which, uh, which I wasn't at, I mean, I wasn't as, uh, into, I just wanted someone to be with me for like more of the, more of that experience. How did things operate? Did you do all of the pricing and pitching and stuff before the rep or when freelance kind of started taking off? Like you just kind of had one in the beginning? No, I, I, I went for about, uh, I want to say like, well, it wasn't that long. I, I probably went for about a month of a hundred percent freelance with no rep, but, um, was it a pain in the ass? It was hard. Yeah. It was hard because I, um, as kind of my presence online was growing and, uh, larger clients were starting to reach out. Um, it was hard to just come up with, I, I didn't even mind the invoicing and all of that. It was just hard to come up with figures that felt appropriate that didn't feel like I was like shooting way too high or, or too low. That also made me sort of look unprofessional or like amateurish. So, um, having that extra level of removal from, from me, um, and having a third person being like, no, he, he costs like this much. And, you know, they clients and art directors, I think feel less of a need to, um, be gentle with my rep as opposed to with me. Um, I think they can, the two of them can get like down to business much more quickly, talk about what's actually in the budget and what's actually I can do for, for the, the amount that's in the budget. And, um, I don't have to deal with any of that. Of course that comes, comes at a cost. Um, but, uh, but I think as far as just not having to deal with that part of the conversation and with worrying about, you know, should I be, you know, if, if I, if I give this, this large company an estimate of like a thousand dollars, are they going to laugh in my face? Because like they were budgeting like, you know, 500 or are they going to think I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm way under, under pricing myself. So, yeah, that's what I struggle with a lot of times too, as I continue to do more and more freelance outside of the day job, it's that. Like, am I overcharging or if I'm underselling myself, am I going to lose it because of this or lose it because of that? Sure. And I, and I did lose 
a couple jobs before getting a rep, um, and um, and jobs that I was pretty stoked about. One was was going to be for Smirnoff, and one was going to be for Renault. And both of them sounded really cool. Uh, I did a ton of research to try to present a, a, an estimate that felt um, industry standard. And um, in both cases, I out there was way off the mark. Like too high. Uh, I think. I, I don't know. I think in, I think in most cases, yeah, I was too high. Um, I, I I referenced the the pricing and ethics guide. I think it's called that the Graphic Arts Guild puts out every year. Uh, but the range there is like insane. Like they were like, yeah, you can charge anywhere between three thousand and thirty thousand. So like, okay, that helps you really narrow it down. Not super helpful. Um, but I was also um, I was doing some some reading online from other designers who the few and far between uh, instances where other designers talk about how much they they charge um, quite openly. And one of the few resources out there was uh, Jess's uh, sort of breakdown of what she charges for an editorial illustration. Um, she did this like fairly comprehensive blog post about it years and years ago. And um, I adjusted for the fact that I'm not Jess and uh, and and made it way lower, but still it was it was way too high. So um, and and I'm not that's not to say that I haven't lost projects with a rap. Yeah, I'm sure. But but at least I can feel okay knowing that like this is not my lack of experience that is causing uh, me to lose a job. It's it's the fact that you know the budget just wasn't right for this particular project. The rep knows kind of what what market value of what I have to offer is. And, and that gives me a sort of de- certain degree of peace of mind. Do they come in ever with like, we have an above the line project or a below the line or NDA or, or NDAs. Do you get that often too? Like work that you can't talk about a lot? Well, yeah, I just recently uh, got hired to do a job that I was supposed to be a super, super, super secret that I couldn't even talk about when I was done with the job. Um, and it was when it was out into the world. But, um, uh, my rep, Audrey, was uh, was really good uh, with with them. She she really fought to get to give me the the right to promote the piece once it's done. Oh, even the piece, not just having to put a select client. Awesome. Yeah. So I thought I thought that at the very least, even if I couldn't say I, um, you know, if I couldn't show this piece that I did for 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 the specific company, um, I could at the very least list them in my client list, but apparently I still couldn't do that. So, uh, she fought for both that and for the, the, the possibility to show the piece, even though the budget was fairly fixed and it was fairly, fairly low for the, for the, for the brand that hired me. Um, I, she was able to, to get that, that, that ability to promote the work, which, which is really important, I think. So, um, so that's one, one extra good part about having a rep is that she has no problem, uh, fighting for that sort of stuff where, whereas, you know, you put, a a, a, a small designer like me in, you know, in an email with a legal team at, you know, whatever the case may be, uh, target or, or Apple or Microsoft or whatever. And, you know, they're like, no, we can't do this. You have to be, you know. And you're just like, okay, <laughs> shit, okay, yeah, whatever you want. So so that that was definitely uh, sort of the latest uh, example of how having a rep has been quite helpful for me anyway. Man, you're convincing me that I need to, like, do outreach and get a rep because i know lauren did outreach and got her rep you know she reached out to a couple places so it's like how why did someone come to you versus you know having to go out to someone what are some what are reps looking for i think they're looking for um some uh something you can provide that is different than other people in their roster mostly um they're i think also in the age of instagram um they're looking for people who are who they think will be a a solid asset to add to their roster who will make them in turn look good and hopefully make them money also obviously um i 
when I was, I was contacted by those two reps and, um, because I was kind of in talks with both of them simultaneously, I decided to reach out to a third rep who's, uh, uh, whose artist, the artist that they represented, I was a huge fan of. So I was like, you know, if they're good enough for like all these like really amazing people, like I, that's who I want to be with. So uh, I reached out to them and they were sort of quite frankly just said, you know, there are too many people on our roster already that are doing the style of lettering that you're doing or that it's, it's still like a little bit too close right now. So um, we we don't want that, that level of overlap. So um, I think what I was um, not what I wasn't super strategic about was that I assumed that because um, there was a rep that represented um, a letter that I loved, you know, that that was the rep for me, when in fact, that's like the opposite of what you want to do. Like if there's a letter that you love, whose work you really admire, being represented by someone, you might want to consider going to a rep that doesn't have very, very much lettering on their roster. And that was the case with Sunday afternoon. They didn't really have any, any lettering at all. So when there's a lettering gig that comes in your first pick, like the kid on the dodgeball team. Yeah. Yeah. Generally. So, um, so that, and, and I liked that it, it was sort of a newer, it was a newer agency that was establishing itself. They were more flexible with their contract terms because they were newer. Um, and because they were the one who reached out to me, um, I feel like I, I didn't, I didn't feel like, I felt like it was, it was going to be a mutually beneficial thing, not just like they were doing me a favor by having me on. So from the outside looking in, it apparently just seems like you're just crushing life right now. I know you've had some of these big name clients. I know the Airbnb one, I was a really big fan and you have all this select client list and featured everywhere, but this show isn't always about the highlight reels. You know, and that's what people like to see because it kind of puts them on the same level as you. Like, holy shit, this person didn't just have everything handed to them. So what's been some of the adversity you faced over the years in honing your craft, uh, finding your voice and making a name for yourself? Because it, it, it's not always easy and nothing's going to be handed to you. You've had to bust your ass. Yeah. So I think the the adversity that... Um sort of I generally, the token adversity I generally use when I, when I, or that I, when I think back on, on just my, my path and my process so far is just getting rejected, uh, from Luis's studio, the studio I really, really wanted to work at. Twice, right? Yeah. Once as an intern, once from an actual job application there. And a third time actually, um, upon coming back from this workshop I did with Luis in Rome, it went, um, it went super well. It was the first chance I had to, to really like get to know her and have her get to know me as a person. And, um, I think we realized, or at the very least, I realized that I could learn a lot from her and I think she saw some potential there. So she was like, when you're back in New York, come and come back to my, come back to my uh, studio with your portfolio. We'll have another look. And I took that incorrectly to mean, um, maybe there's, you know, maybe there's still a chance you'll get to work for her. And, um, even though you just, you just got an email three weeks prior saying the position has been filled. So, um, so I was even considering sort of cutting my trip short, uh, cause I was in Italy at the time doing this workshop and, um, my family is still there. So I was going to spend, uh, an extra two or three weeks with my family before heading back to New York. But I was like, should I take this opportunity and just like go back to New York early? But ultimately I just decided I wanted to spend time with my, my family since I don't, I don't get to see them that often. So, um, and I'm glad I did because when I got back, you know, really, what it was, was kind of an informational sort of interview where she looked at my work again and, um, we talked about kind of just my career prospects moving forward. And she restated that she was unable to give me a job at the time, uh, at her studio, uh, which sort of broke my heart all over again. But, um, but 
she also was tremendously helpful at that at that point by pointing me in a lot of really good directions. So she pointed me towards Mateo uh, at Muka, who ended up hiring me as an intern. And uh, she also, she just has been ever since then kind of a, a very kind of important mentor figure for me, uh, even before working for her, even in the two years that elapsed between that sort of rejection and, and when I actually got to work for her. So, but I was pretty devastated. So um, I, I was really upset for a solid two weeks uh, afterwards. I was just, uh, I was like, you know, if I, w if I blew this chance and like, if I wasn't able to get in now, you know, when, it, when is this gonna happen for me? Uh, and um, so that was probably the hardest um, time. And finding a voice, making a name for myself, all of that. I feel like that's like lifelong tasks. Like, Yeah, I'm still working on mine too at the age of almost 30. I mean, finding a voice, I don't, I don't think I've, I've found one. I think I've found a, something that's maybe on its way to becoming a voice. I'd like to interject and say I really enjoy the storytelling and you know some of the, the captions and just wittiness and cleverness that you have within your post. I, I would say you totally find your voice that shines alongside your work, or at least you're you're on the right path if you say you're still looking for it. So yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely still working on it. I um, I am often thinking about what m my work might look like or, or how I'm gonna feel about the work I do today in like ten years when Instagram doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know going back to kind of like the motivation behind what, why I do what I do, uh, trying to keep that as, um, as front and center as possible as I create work, um, has been, has been important. But I, I think like all of us, I, the search for a voice is this, if, as, especially when we're young, it feels like this, this desperate search because it's, you know, you need it. And, uh, everybody's is is looking for one themselves and people seem to have found one and uh and so i think it's normal and it's a common pitfall to sort of look look around at what everybody else is doing and see kind of um trying to form a voice from other people's voices if that makes any sense and regurgitating everyone else oh man i've been there been there yeah me too so many times and i find myself going down that road still often i'll see something that i like and and uh i i i see it coming back it like two projects down the road i'm like oh wait this is like i see where where this come i, I can see the the history of this or the the path that got me to this quite clearly and it's not through some obscure primary source it's it's through this thing that this this really talented person did and posted on Instagram. So um, I think that's something that I struggle with still in in the search of of kind of my voice and 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 honing my craft. But um, as far as how I've gotten to where I am, I really value uh, practicing something. So I really value like um, a more you know being having studied for years as like having studied classical music um just the idea of you know it's just you and your instrument in a, in a practice room for three hours a day doing something that nobody's gonna hear uh and you're just doing it because you need to get better and this kind of toiling away in, in darkness and anonymity is something that we don't always think is part of the creative process as a visual designer, but I've always sort of considered that as part of the process as well. So, um, and I've, you know, had to do a ton of really shitty work that nobody saw. Um, and, and I continue to do, uh, shitty work that I often don't post, um, as I'm trying to like kind of explain, get just get better your safe place to explore and improve and I, I like to think of it as grind while no one's watching because that's where the true growth happens that instrument thing that was beautiful because like i, I played drums and piano for nine years and i kind of just gave it up but now like my instrument is 
you know, pens and pencils. And now it's become like procreate just because of my crazy schedule. You know, that's what I need. It's the same process. It's, you know, it's the same iterative, uh, it's the same iterative circular process of, you know, just, um, doing that same thing over and over again and doing the best that you can do until the next day you can do a tiny bit better. That, that's beautiful. Before we go into rapid fire questions, what's one piece of advice you'd give to a creative at any stage of life who struggles starting or sticking with it? Because you've dealt with rejection and persisting. I think, um, I think starting and, and sticking with uh, are so important, both of them, uh, and they require, I think, so, like so slightly different skill sets. Um, and, and as a result, slightly different pieces of advice, um, as far as, as far as I know. So, I mean, starting is 90% of the time the hardest thing to do, but it's also the, I think most crucial. Um, and, uh, I think John Cage like famously said, just begin, begin anywhere. And I think that is so important. Just like, um, it doesn't matter if it's fully thought out. It doesn't matter if it's, uh, sound smart or sound stupid, um, giving yourself permission to create something for no other reason than because you want to see that thing into the, in the world, I think is, uh, has been very important for me who, uh, and I have a tendency to overthink things and to kind of, um, have this impossibly high bar for work that I do before it can even see the light of day before I even give myself permission to, to put it on paper, I feel like it has to be thought out and it has to be perfect and it has to have a name and it has to have a commercial application, which none of that is necessary. Uh, it just has to exist and it evolves as it exists. So, and, and as it sort of comes into being, but, um, as far as, so, so yeah, my advice, uh, will, would mirror John Cage's advice and just sort of begin anywhere as long as you begin. But my advice as far as sticking with something, um, you know, in, uh, in January, I started learning French. That was kind of my, my non-design hobby now, uh, which I thought was really important to have. And, and often with any new thing, whether it's design or, or a new language, there's, it's, it's sticking with something is, is like, seems impossibly difficult sometimes. And, um, I guess my, what I, tell myself when I'm, uh, very close to giving up, which happens quite often, um, is not super, it might, it doesn't sound terribly inspired. Uh, but I try to focus on the fact that continuing something is obviously a decision and not continuing something and not sticking with something is just as much of a decision as, as, as sticking with it in the first place. So, in, in my case right now, when I'm feeling pissed off at the subjunctive or the, or the, uh, the, the sort of the past tense or whatever of French, I'm like, okay, so I don't feel like doing a hundred flashcards right now, but the alternative to learning French is not learning French. So, uh, do I, the alternative to like not doing this other prosaic when I was in the middle of my series is like, is, is not doing it. The alternative to doing it is not doing it. So do I want to not do this? Like, do I want to be the person who doesn't do this or do I want to just make it happen and just do it? So I, I doesn't sound terribly fluent or eloquent, but at the same time, like focusing on crossroads or like a, a fork in the road where you're like, I have to make a decision. I either do it or I don't do it. And not doing it is not the default path necessarily that I have to work towards, you know, I have to work against. It's just one of my two decisions and sort of not allowing myself to just default into not doing something has been really useful. I, I like that. Do you want to be the person who does do it or doesn't do it? Like you kind of just simplified it. That that's, And then the first part is giving yourself basically permission to suck. Just allowing other people to see that like, you know, this is a thing I did and it's not perfect, but maybe the next thing is going to, the next one is going to be better. I mean, before Fosaics, I did quite a few personal projects that didn't get past like three in the series. And even as I was doing Fosaics, you know, 
when I decided I was going to make that into my passion to pay pers personal project, I started overthinking it. And I was like, well, I have to have a better, better concept and better name and I better. Um, and so I, I started adding all these unnecessarily uh, unnecessary layers of complexity that didn't need to be there. So, um, so once all that got stripped off and I decided to just, just do the next one as is and see where it takes me. And then as I was doing, uh, piece after piece, they, the, the series kind of just evolved on its own. It, it was it, it kind of like, I didn't have to think through every detail beforehand. And, and stop getting so caught up on the results of things and how people are going to take it as long as you're kind of like enjoying it and allowing yourself to explore and experiment within the process. And I think, I think that's what really leads to, you know, the home runs. Rapid fire questions. This is my favorite one. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? Uh, <laughs> um, I I think uh, it would probably be uh, like a, a good like like a high quality Italian thin crust pizza with um, really like really high quality tomato sauce um, and some fresh basil or something pretty simple um, nothing too like nothing too packed but like just really solid high quality ingredients I think that would be that would be great. Mm. It's my cheat day today, so you know you already know what I'm gonna go for. So, <laughs> all right. So Darcy Shanker asks, how many hours does a typical fosaic take? Um, it takes twelve to twenty four hours of work. Twelve to twenty four. That's it. Yeah. So I get mixed mixed responses when I when I say that. Like some people are like, that's it, and some people are like, oh my god, that's so much time. But it's sort of the range is dictated by like the the complexity of this, the particular pattern. Some patterns are just faster to work to work through uh, than others. But generally, I think the one that took the longest probably took a solid 24, maybe 26 hours of work. That is a lot of work. It, it really is a lot of work. So especially if it's like for a commercial, you know? It's, yeah, it's a lot. It is a lot of time. And it is a lot of time also for an Instagram post. Oh, I, yeah, it is. Especially for a series, even if it's a personal project. Like, holy shit, it is a lot of work. I was kind of just being an asshole <laughs> uh, but i would think it'd be like way longer like i would think it's also like a huge compliment for me when someone thinks that it's not very much time because it, it it means to me it means that like these pieces look like they take a lifetime to do which is which is sort of the desired effect for me like that like that austin ambergram one with mark Canesso. wow like that one was absolutely i that's like the first time I've just like shared someone else's work on my Instagram because I loved it so much. That's so nice to hear. Yeah, I mean, that was such a good... I mean, I was so happy when when, when he agreed to to do this. Uh, and we, we sort of like came to do to, came to sort of agree to do it together, which was awesome. Um, and then he was like really open to any sort of changes I had to make to the art to make it work as a as a tiled piece. And, uh, and I was also open to uh, changes in sort of color palette and texture that we we decided on once the piece was done. And I think uh, the result is definitely one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorites of the series so far. It was wild. All right, so script serif or sans serif? Um, I am going to say sans serif, and that might be what? like somewhat surprised. That I'm super surprised. I would have guessed serif first, just from like your older decorative style, and then I would have went like script next. But I could see your modern contemporary side, even though I think you're more historical of things. Yeah, I do love I do love a good sans serif. I'm not I'm not saying Helvetica necessarily as my sans more serif. More like Art Deco. Yeah, I do a lot. Lots of Art Deco type is sans serif. Yeah, for sure. But script is is like it's up there with script. I it's probably a tie. I said sans serif just to sort of like shock you, but uh, sans serif and scripts are are pretty much there for me. I do love a good. A good script also. What's your favorite typeface? Uh, or what are you vibing to the most right now? Because that's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I might say like whatever the latest typeface Luis designed is. Uh, is she probably. just put out a new one, right? It was like an Art Deco one, right? She just, yeah, it's called, yeah, Marseille. And she just released six weights of it. So we'll plug it in the show notes so people can get familiar. And her, of course, we'll show her a lot of love in this. Yeah, but as far as uh, as classic typefaces, I'm I'm a big fan of Futura. Ooh, Avenir's mine. 
Yeah, that's a good. So, Frutiger. Okay, here we go. Uh, if you were stranded on an island with only three possessions, what would they be? No cheating. Lauren tried saying a uh, speedboat. That doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's always like I never like I don't know if I have to be like practical and say like a satellite phone, a generator, and like a Swiss Army knife. That shit's cheating. Nope. You you. It's not like you got to be planned with all of it. I don't have to be like a survivalist. No, okay. not survivalist. Uh, my professional self would probably take like iPad Pro, Apple Pencil, and charger. <laughs> charge it into a coconut or something <laughs> right well if you had if you could let me take that generator that okay, i said okay, a second ago yes. it's like into that but um probably if we're being real uh it would probably be like uh some like a really good book like uh probably like the collected jane austen or something i'm a big, big jane austen fan uh then uh something to write with uh and then uh sunscreen i think all right perfect um I guess I should ask this. What can people look forward to? Do you got anything coming up that people should be aware of? Uh, well, I do. I do have uh, I'm, I'm teaching a lot of workshops, but most of the ones that are scheduled uh, until August have sold out. Uh, I am so but I am uh, working on online versions of my workshops. Uh, just, just just seems like the smart thing to do. Get that passive income going. Yeah, you can't you can't be Jesus and be everywhere at once. So. So I'm doing, I've been doing a, an Art Deco lettering workshop sort of around the United States and, uh, and also I did it in Australia as well. And, uh, that's been, that's been pretty successful. So I would love to develop that into like a high quality online class. So, um, though there's nothing at the moment to plug, I guess it's just like, it's sort of like, keep your, like, keep your eyes open for that. I like promoting those kind of things here on the show. So when it does kind of get close or something, please let me know. I'll, I'll I stalk you on Instagram anyway, so I'll be sure to plug it then. So where can people go to find you online? Uh, well, Instagram is the primary place. I'm not I'm not big on the other platforms, really. I find that like not being much of a sort of a sharer, one platform is like enough for me. But uh, Instagram is uh, probably where I'm most active and where uh, my most recent work is, my, my portfolio website as many of ours is like dra like dramatically out of date. So, um, I, I, yeah, um, I'm like occasionally on Twitter, but not, not a ton. Okay. And that's at Nick Masani. That is at, they're both at Nick Masani. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Nick, thank you so much for making this finally work. I know it was on me to finally get, you know, get this scheduled, but I sincerely appreciate your time. It's been so awesome watching your career explode i've been watching you when you had a fraction of the followers that you have now and before you had all the client work so it's just been amazing to watch you grow and thank you for sharing all this valuable information with the listeners today so i appreciate you man thank you so much it's been such a pleasure being here finally all right we'll be in touch okay sounds good take care All right, podcast family, Nick freaking Masani. Nick is the type of person I can see being a household name in the creative industry easily in the next five years or less. You know, he's found what works from him. He pays attention to the details, but he isn't afraid to experiment and challenge himself in multiple facets of life. When you combine curiosity, talent, and drive together, you get a lethal elixir, and that's what's flowing through Nick's veins. So, Seeing him succeed is inevitable in my mind. I encourage you to check out his work and don't be afraid to drop him a line and show him some love if you found value in today's episode. I know he'd appreciate it. So thank you, Nick. Hope we get a chance to link up in person sometime down the road. Moving on to this week's dose of inspiration. This one goes out to my brother, Adam Grayson. That's Grayson as in G-R-A-S-O-N. There is no Y on it. Don't ask me why, I don't know. But Adam is not only a brilliant illustrator, but he's a genuine, down-to-earth dude who prides himself in not being a dick. I know you've seen his work floating around as he has this evolved style similar to Mary Blair, and he's also a wizard with grain shading. I'm also looking at having him on the show in June, so keep a lookout for this juggernaut to swing by. Next, I want to talk about the Facebook community, so if you're looking for accountability, a place to share your work, people to collaborate with, 
people to give and receive solid feedback, getting access to resources that'll elevate your creative game, then I encourage you to check out the Perspective Dash Collective Facebook group. We have a thriving and popping community building right now, and we would love to have you be a part of it. So hop on Facebook and search for The Perspective Dash Collective to get involved with some rad people. If you enjoy what you hear and you want to support the growth of the show, I have a few ways you can make that happen. The first is by becoming a backer at patreon.com slash perspective podcast. Not only can you donate with as little as much as your weekly cup of coffee, but I do my best to hook you up with some rewards, so it's a win-win. The second way to support the show is for you crypto junkies out there. In the show notes for each episode, I'll have addresses for Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin donations. If you prefer to go that route, that'd be swell. And finally, you can leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts. It not only helps the show get discovered, but it gives me an opportunity to give you, the listener, a nice little thank you plug in return. And please subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. And this week's rating and review comes from Orangelini14, and it's titled, Great Show. They say, if you're creative, you should be listening to this podcast. Short, sweet, relatable, and inspirational. Keep it up, Scotty. Thank you so much. I sincerely appreciate reading this off each time I hop on an episode. It means the world to me, and you know I hope it's cool that you get a nice little public thank you as well. So I really sincerely appreciate it. And as I wrap things up, I want to give a huge thank you to Anya Brennan for making this episode sound so good. And also a thank you to Nick Jenkins of Bluka for all the dope theme music you hear on the show. Check them out at SoundCloud or on Instagram at Bluka. That's B-L-O-O-K-A-H. And as you finish off your week strong, I want to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this. You got this.